Hi, everyone, and welcome to another one of Zoom Info's great webinars titled Tips and Tricks to Differentiate Your Virtual Selling Strategy. So appreciate you all joining us today. Um, we're going to get into introing our speakers as usual, but first I need to cover some housekeeping items um, before we start. So um, housekeeping items, if you're experiencing any issues while any technical issues while watching this webinar, please let us know using the Q&A chat. Um, we'll do the best that we can to help alleviate those issues. A couple of quick tips is just refreshing your window. This is a web-based platform. Um, and by refreshing your window, it should help with some of glitchiness or connectivity issues you may be experiencing. But feel free, submit, us in, submit some of those issues within the Q&A chat and we will do the best that we can to help. Um, also use that Q&A chat to let us know and let the speakers know if you have any questions. We're gonna be taking questions at the end. Feel free to submit them throughout, um, but let us know definitely if you have any questions using that Q&A chat. You'll receive a recording within 48 hours after we conclude today. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. Um, and then we lastly, one of the last things we have is a survey. This is something new-ish that we're trying to fold into our programs. We really wanna make sure that we're providing the most content, the best content, accurate content that you're looking for from us. Um, so feel free to submit that survey throughout the session or at the end, we'd love to hear from you. Alrighty, last housekeeping item is ZoomInfo is a publicly traded company. This presentation may contain forward-looking statements. Any buying decisions you make should be made based only upon currently available products and offerings. This is our complete safe harbor statement displayed here for your review, but we've also added it in the resource center. If you really want to take a deeper dive, um, feel free. Alrighty, so as you all know, our fantastic lineup um, or power panel as I've been wanting to fold into my webinars. Um, but as you know, we've got this great duo that we've that we've been running webinars with. I think this is the first one for this year. So i um, super excited to get you guys back on um, for 2022. Um, but Jeb Blount is here. He's the CEO of Sales Gravy. If you don't know him, he's also a best-selling author of many, biz many books, um, especially one on virtual selling specifically. So definitely check that out. Um, and then his great counterpart and teammate here, Will Fertini. He is a sales director here at ZoomInfo. Um, we've been producing webinars together as a group for, I think, over two years now. Um, so if not longer. So this is a great lineup, you guys. If you haven't been joined, haven't joined us in the past, um, you'll definitely get a lot out of this in the future. So um, thank you both, Jeb and Will, for joining us. Very glad to be here. <laughs> it's awesome to be back with both of you. Power panel, I like that. <laughs> Likewise, so, so excited to be doing this again. Awesome. Okay, so just a little refresher, audience members, of what we're gonna be covering today. Um, mastering virtual selling techniques gives you a massive competitive advantage because it allows you to engage more prospects and customers in less time at a lower cost, potentially, while reducing the sales cycle. So while virtual selling is powerful, uh, just like this power panel, many sellers are still looking to improve their skills and close more deals, but how? So you're here today to learn from these experts on how to engage prospects, coach, and train virtually, and obviously, inevitably, and hopefully close more deals faster. Um, so awesome. All right, guys, let's get into this. Um, my first question I'm going to toss to um, Jeb, really want to kick this off with kind of the psychology around um, influencing prospects. So how can reps use psychology to influence prospects on a video call? Well, I want you to think about a couple of things. One is called encoding and one is called decoding. Okay, so, um, so encoding is when I send a message to another person. And the easiest way to send a message to another person, both verbally and non-verbally, so what you say and how you say it, uh, is in person. So when we're we're face to face with someone, there's a lot of communication that is happening, and there's studies from Paul Eichmann um, around you know micro expressions. But there's a lot of of, of, of studies that's been hap you know that's happened over the years uh, in how people communicate in person. So if I want to send you a message or I get you to feel something, um, I encode. Decoding is how people take the message you're sending and then make meaning of it. So if you're standing in front of someone and you're having a conversation and you smile, right, then they're likely to smile back because they're gonna feel just like you smiled a little bit there, Rebecca, because as soon as I smile, you Got smile, me. right? Exactly, <laughs> so I, I'm sending a message and, and then you, you then decode the message and you make meaning of it. In person is the very best way for human beings to communicate because all of that communication happens almost flawlessly. It just, it just happens, uh, unless you're completely socially inept, and most salespeople are not. 
So when we talk about virtual selling, and you think about virtual selling in, in a couple of formats, we're talking about synchronous or asynchronous, but primarily synchronous communication. You have the telephone, which has been a virtual, virtual selling tool since 1876, when Alexander Graham Bell made the first phone call to Watson. Uh, and then there's video calling, which by, by the way, most people don't realize that the first video calls made in 1927 by Herbert Hoover at AT&T Labs, or Bell Labs. So I mean, it's been around for a long time. But when we think about decoding and encoding, the psychology of, of taking a message and sending a message to another person, it gets a little bit harder on the phone and on video. Now, Will's familiar with phone sales because inside sales has been selling over the phone since the phone's been around. And we always talked about smiling on the phone, like putting a smile on your voice and, um, and changing your pace and flexing to the other person. Uh, and, and then we moved into full on video. I mean, I just, it's, it's hard to remember how many phone calls I've even had in the last six months. I mean, everything is video now. Everybody wants to talk to you. And in fact, uh, McKinsey, a study that McKinsey came out with said that 71% of buyers would prefer a video call over a phone call, primarily because of this encoding and decoding process. When they can see you, it feels more personal. And therein lies how do we use virtual or the psychology of virtual. The psychology of virtual, primarily a video call, should be to create the closest facsimile to a face-to-face -face, in person conversation as possible and and that means that the messages that we're sending via how we look right or how we speak or the words that we choose like how, you know the, the the messaging that we choose all of those things matter and they matter in aggregate like you can't i was pointing out to a, a young man that i was training yesterday who had his camera pointed this way so he was way down in his chair like this and the camera was pointing up and I was coaching him on, uh, on presence on video just because the way he looked, I'm not buying from him. If you're mm -hmm. in inside sales and you're calling business owners in Iowa and you're in San Francisco and you think a hoodie is the right way to go calling a, you know, a per person in Iowa who's a small business person in say agriculture, you're wrong. So all of the, the, the rules that matter in person would matter on video, but you have to think about video in terms of eye contact, framing, your lighting, your audio, the, the, what you have on, like the, the, even the color that you have on in order to, as you send messages to the buyer, cause them to lean into you, to believe you, right, to trust you and to like you and want to do business with you. And there's a lot that goes into that, but if you, if you think about it, Rebecca, what I just said is it sounds almost tedious, right? You're, you're, you're literally have to take every single part of your video frame, judge it and perfect it and make it better. But when you do, it's a game changer. And real quickly, before I throw you back to the next question, I just want to tell you a quick story that happened to us just last week. So we have a big company that came to us because we got, they got referred by another company to do sales training for them. But they, their learning development team is putting out an RFP. So they're going to multiple training companies with an RFP. We got in really late in the process. And it was just because a friend of a friend said, go check out Sales Gravy. So they come to us and one of our salespeople gets on in one of our sales studios. We have sales studios set up lighting, audio, the way we look, the way we act, great cameras, everything, and does a discovery call with them. And they agree to the next step, does another call with them. They send us a letter telling us that we had moved to first place in their, in their pick because only because they were so impressed with how we look on camera, like the whole, everything that we engineer. And, and so we, we went from last to first only because of the psychology, right? The ability to send this message that we're professionals and we walk our talk on video. Wow, that's wild. I think that's, I mean, I, I feel that in my world just because I'm on the marketing team running webinars and this is my game. So I feel like I have to have a decent background here, but. You don't think about it when you're as a salesperson or as a marketing person that's not on um, a kind of way that you need to be presenting every single day and making sure that you have that background. I know there's a lot of people that I work with internally that just get on calls automatically with their cameras off. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, we could have just picked up the phone and talked then instead of having this meeting or the, the only way for us to have an in-person, in a sense, meeting is to do this over a video call. Um, any tips, uh, Will, from your perspective on just kind of influencing your team to better understand how to utilize that type of psychology when it comes to um, webinars and or not webinars, but virtual, virtual selling. Yeah. I mean, I love that anecdote because I think the pandemic has given us all a chance 
who sell inside to be human and be field salespeople all over again. And I used to do door to door sales in Austin, Texas, and I would walk around with a blazer on and people did think I was auditing them when I walked into their office because nobody wore jackets there, but it was, it created intrigue and people wanted to know why I was there. And so the same is true. I always think this Jeb, when we do these, like y'all have an incredible studio set up. So you don't look like the head floating over the golden gate grid, which is cool. Let's be fair. Like that's fun and all, but it's so distracting. Like I want to know where the heck are you? If I'm looking at your screen and I'm very fortunate to have a similar setup. We've moved since we've done these last year, Jeb, I was in my attic, but we had like Pelotons in the background and it was funny for a minute because People were like, where are you? You work from home. That's a cool setup. And it broke ice, just like my little blazer did with my cowboy boots when I was walking around doing software recruiting in Austin, Texas. And so I think you have to be aware of the fact that without creating distraction, if you can command attention just in the way your background and your presence is set up, it's a great psychological influencer on your sales calls. And, and there's a time and place for video. You're doing a sales presentation and a demo um, and your face covers a quarter of the screen, <laughs> turn your video off because you need to show the piece of your product that you're showing, right? But the minute you hop back to that human interaction, get on video again, just like you're sitting across the table from someone, right? But like, I bet most people watching this webinar wouldn't assume, Jeb, you're in a studio. They would be like, where is the Zoom info thing? That's great, all those books, oh my God. I mean, and it's it's a testament to, you look like you do it for a living and that puts your buyer at ease. I think that's, yes. that's my dovetail of that anecdote, agreeing with your anecdote. It's like, they knew that Jeb's team does this for a living and they do it really well. And so they instantly trust his business and, you know, if you show your background that you're kind of fuzzed out in your bedroom. And again, I, I have to be very clear about what I'm talking about. There are many people that don't have the benefit of an office setup or a studio or their own home office. I understand that. I'm not talking about those that are doing the best with what they can. I'm talking about those that have the choice or the option. And it's been two years. There are a lot of ways you can even make your kitchen a studio you buy a green screen on amazon for 200 bucks with your commission check you made last month and put it up behind you if you can't or aren't comfortable going to an office setup right um because it really really shoot i mean i love that story man you got there last and you went to first just because you look like you do it for a living i mean that's that's the whole that's the whole game well, you know, but you, like you said, everybody else is showing up in their kitchen and on their, you know, their laptop camera. And like, you know, this is we're we're two years into it and it's, you know, it's tough to, to, to try to explain to people. You need to go get a good camera and you need to get a decent microphone and you need to um, if you need to blur your background, there, there are tools you can blur your background or, you know, there you can buy a small backdrop. You don't have to spend a lot of money on it. It has your brand on it or. Um, you know, you can, you can like what Rebecca's got, she's got a nice corner. Like she's just in a corner, which is a really nice frame because of the way the walls frame around you. Uh, and there's not a lot of distractions in there. Um, so you, there's, you know, there's, you, there's things that you can do, but it's being intentional. But if you think about it, you know, Will, back when you were, you were out in the field selling and I go back to when I was out in the field selling, you know, before I went in to a call, I made sure that everything was right. I made sure that I was riding, wearing the right clothes. And, you know, sometimes I was in places where I would change out of a tie just into a blazer. And there were other times when I'd walk in with a tie. And, but I would make sure that everything was perfect because what I realized is that in sales, in most cases, you're winning by an edge. And that edge is almost always how people feel, not how they think, right? So it's, it's what, they, what they perceive about you. And like, you know, in my background, a lot of people say, is that virtual background? And I go, I go, but no, I go back and touch the bricks. I go, no, this is real. This was, this was built for this. Yep. But even a, a little thing like, we, you know, we talk about um, the psychology of this. People may not look at you and know what's wrong consciously, but their brain knows that it doesn't look right. The brain knows that the frame that they're looking at doesn't look right. And you talk about distractions, Will. 
one of the, uh, the, the, the coolest uh, graphics I saw was from uh, Microsoft and what they were working on their teams, but they showed what the human brain looks like. It's just a picture of the brain and it's like overheated when it's trying to look at a video call frame and figure out what's going on versus what does a frame look like when it's watching TV or a movie? Like you never get off off the couch and go, man, I got Netflix fatigue. You never do that. Like you will get off, the, but you get off of, a, of a Zoom call. And you got, I got Zoom fatigue. It's not because you're on video. It's because the the frames in front of you don't look right, and your brain is processing, trying to fill in all the gaps so that it looks the way that human beings are supposed to look. Which is why you need to get your framing right. You know, you you want to you don't want to be too close to the camera. You don't want to be too far away. You you want the you want to be straight up and down. You want to have a vertical and a horizontal line that makes you look like a newscaster. Typically, I stand up. Like I, most of my sales team stands up when we're on calls because it allows us to have full body movement so people can see our hands. Uh, crazy enough, you know, Rebecca, from a, a psychological standpoint, when people can't see your hands, they worry about what your hands are doing because all through human history, hands have been lethal weapons, right? So but they can see that. One of the cool things that we do, Will, that you'll, you'll, you'll dig this, is that when we do discovery calls, we put whiteboards behind us and we have a we have virtual whiteboards. So in a lot of cases, I'll have like two or three salespeople on the call at the same time for working on a big deal. And we'll have we have smart boards. So everybody is working on the same board. So as we're writing on one board, it shows up on the other. And as I'm doing discovery and the client is answering my questions, I'm writing down their answers on the board so they can see them. This was the, the, one of the coolest things ever. I, I know people love this because it's completely transparent and it makes them feel good. But we were having this conversation with a CEO and I think one of the CEOs of uh, SVPs and they were like hammering us over, we're the right company for them. It was a, a big uh, commercial real estate company to work with their sales team. And so as he's talking, I'm asking questions and I'm writing things down and he's talking, 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 I'm writing things down. And, you know, and I'm writing every word he's saying on the board behind me. And suddenly he just stops and he leans in and he goes, wow, you guys are the only company that's really listened to us. Now think about how powerful that's coming from the core decision maker. The yeah. only reason he said that is just because I'm writing down what he's saying behind me and he can see the evidence that I'm actually writing those things down. So, I mean, it's active listening that he can see. You can't do that in somebody's office. You can't go, hey, can I borrow your, your, your whiteboard for a minute? I mean, you have to write down on a notepad. But, and if you, even if you, by the way, you don't have a smart board, you can get one of those flip charts from Amazon for 40 bucks and you can put it behind you and take notes while you're standing up while they're talking. They love it. And, and you have a nice record of everything that you talked about. I mean, I still old school it, man. Like, I would love the digital whiteboard set up for myself. But, like, this is a skill I had to learn while I was in person selling. And if you don't do it well, it's uncomfortable for both parties. You can't, oh, sorry, let me write all that down. So I had to learn this skill. But... What Jeff just said, people love to know that you're actually going to remember what they said. Not to mention the human brain forgets 60% of what it hears. So even if you're recording your conversation over a Zoom meeting or a Teams call, to go back and listen to the whole thing for 30, 40 minutes, like you probably missed 60% of what they said, even if you are trying to pay attention, right? So yep. little tips of how do I show someone I'm listening, how do I actually remember stuff? I have to write something down just to remember it. That's just a tip for me, right? It's here, here's, a, here's an important tip for taking notes. Uh, however you choose to take them. Uh, we have a whiteboard behind you, you have a virtual whiteboard. It's, you, it, you, it's very obvious. You go, okay, can I take some notes on the whiteboard? Would you mind? They say, sure. When, when I, most of my career I spent selling in person. So when I was in person face to face, etiquette would be when you sit down you would ask may i sit down and the person would say yes and you would say may i take notes and they would say yes um the, one of the problems that we have on a virtual environment especially video is that we have an issue with eye contact so when you, when you're in person the human being in front of you can see the entire picture so if you're sitting in front of them and you're taking notes and you're looking down they don't their brain doesn't feel wow that just person just broke eye contact with me they said, wow, that person thinks that what I just said is really important and they're writing it down, which makes them feel good. The problem with virtual is that, uh, is that when you break eye contact, because typically the person can't see everything that's happening around you, their brain at the subconscious level says, wow, that person's not listening to me anymore, or I wonder what they're doing, or are they, are they not paying attention to me? 
not, not happening at the conscious level, happening at the subconscious level. So what you want to do when you enter a virtual call with someone and you're like, well, you're taking notes, is you say, I've got my notepad right here with me. And I use, a, I use a, a, a tool called, when I'm taking regular notes, I use a Remarkable because I can send a PDF to the salesperson. So I, I say, I'm, I've got my digital notepad right here. I'm going to be taking notes. Would that be okay? And they say yes. And then I've got the notepad up. And when, I'm, when I lean down to take the note, they know what I'm doing. So in other words, I'm pre-framing. Like I'm, and this is, this is psychology, right? I'm telling them in advance that I'm paying attention to them. So I'm, I'm, I'm encoding that into their brain. So... So a really simple thing, and the same thing if you have to, especially like, let's just say that you're, you know, you sell software. I'm sure, Will, when you're, your folks are doing a demo, a lot of times they're working on multiple screens. And one of the things that just drives me absolutely nuts is when I'm on a video call with someone and they've got multiple screens and their camera is on one screen and their other stuff is on another screen. So they spend the entire time looking at their camera here and I'm looking at the side of their face. So, so are, you know, are they're looking at their screen over here, and I'm looking at the side. What, it makes me nuts. Yeah. But if you preframe, you say, Rebecca, during the demo, I've got multiple screens in front of me, so I'm going to be moving from screen to screen. So there's going to be times when I'm going to break eye contact in order to get the information that you need. Will that be okay? And and Rebecca, uh, instantly now I've given you a frame of what's happening around me, and when I break eye contact. It, it's, it's not going to make you feel like I don't care about you. Or let's just say that the, you're, you know, you're in a situation and you're working with one of your existing accounts and the customer says, hey, what about this? And you have to look it up. You say, um, give me just a moment. I'm going to break eye contact with the camera just for a moment so that I can go look that up. Or let me find that on my desk. So, so you announce to the person what you're doing in your environment because they can't see it. It sets them at ease. And oh, by the way, it makes you come off incredibly professional because no one else does that. Well, that's what it goes to the, you do this for a living, mm -hmm. right? And that puts someone at ease. When I, if I'm going into something I've never done, I'm gonna have my guard up, I'm gonna be skeptical, I'm gonna be looking for reasons to not do things, all the things buyers think about every day. So in sales, right, if you, if you show any signs or signals that you're not really comfortable with doing what you're doing, why am I gonna feel comfortable with you, right? Um, you mentioned earlier, I, I would, I would say too, you know, no bias to products or companies, but I went out and bought a nice webcam for myself and I bought one for everybody on my team at the end of last year. It's yeah. You know, yes. Yeah. It's a little bit of money, but it's got a microphone built in. It's got an HD camera and I put it right on my monitor where all my primary content is for that exact reason, Jeb. So I'm not looking down and showing my chins at my laptop or I'm not going to five different places because it is, those are the things, buyers are emotional, not logical, that they are going to remember you for. I was talking to someone who didn't even know where I was on the screen. That's the number one thing they're gonna remember you for. Now you may do a phenomenal job and still close business without that, but like imagine how much more successful you would be if that was something you never had to even worry about happening on your conversations, right? Um, but these are little, exactly. it's been two years. Like we're not going back, right? So you gotta go walk through that door and you've gotta go adopt all these digital things that are making us better salespeople. And if you don't, you're not going to succeed. I hate to be so blunt about it, no pun intended, but that is literally what most sales organizations need to understand now is that the world has changed. We may go back into an office, but your client doesn't wanna meet you the first time while they've already met six other vendors in person, they want to have a Zoom call with you. They want to have a Teams call with you. And you can still be the number one selected vendor, no jinxies, light a candle for your deal, right? <laughs> that could come in late and not even have to be on site. Now, Jeb's going to be on site. That's part of what y'all do. Maybe will, maybe won't, but you'll be there if they want you to. But imagine that world where you come in and you know what you're doing so well that you can steal business away from your competition just because you know where the camera is on your screen or just because you bought your reps a better version of a camera than what comes on their laptop, right? Uh, these are little things that cost 180 bucks that can be million dollar return generators for you, it should be, and are ways to build repeatable wins across the team. Even there's solutions out there that could isolate those moments of, hey, you broke contact here, look at the, Look at the game film, see the person's reaction when you stop looking at them, right? 
those are all moments now that we're coaching to as well. You know, two years ago, five years ago, no way, right? You'd have to be in person on a ride along with your boss to get that feedback. feedback. And, and as you can tell that Will is a true sales professional because he's superstitious. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm like, when I'm on a roll, by the way, you know, like I won't let people wash my walk, my coffee cup. Like if I'm closing deals, I'm like, nobody washes my coffee cup because there's something in there that's working right now. I don't know what it is. Uh, I used to have a boss, by the way, that, you know, you're, you're going to a closing appointment and you had your tie on and you're like, you got your closing tie on? You go, yeah. And if you came back without the deal, he would take scissors and cut the, cut the tie in half and nail it to the wall. Like this tie didn't have any luck in it anymore. So, but Will's exactly right. So the, you know, if you start thinking about the, the world, the world has changed. Give, let me give you a couple of stats. So big global study on the state of B2B selling, 76% of customers who are working with an account manager, so this is an existing account, say that they would prefer a virtual interaction to a face-to-face -face interaction when they're just working on account-related activities. That doesn't mean that there's not a time to meet face-to-face, -face, but in most cases, buyers that they get, if I meet you a couple of times a year and the rest of it is virtual, I'm happy. And the same thing, uh, I think 73% of buyers said they would prefer, Will's, Will's numbers back this up, a virtual interaction at the beginning of the sales cycle. So just to evaluate whether or not we even need to be talking to each other, do we like each other enough to create interest, let's just do that. And that's a, that's a good thing because what that means is when you're using virtual, you can get infinitely more deals into your pipeline because you can have those first time appointments or initial meetings, however you and your organization call it, you can do more of those. I mean, that's the beginning of the pipe. So if I get more of those in, then it means that I can vet out the ones that aren't gonna be viable so I can work on good deals, but I can put a lot more robustness in my pipeline going forward. And, and but it does come down to, you've gotta make people feel good. This is, we, we can't lose sight of the fact that we are dealing with human beings and that people feel and then they think. And a lot of the way they feel is at the subconscious level. So uh, I, I gave, in, in you know, I gave an example in, um, in the book of back in the 1990s. Don't judge me. I am old. Uh, but back in the 1990s, I was a young, you know, 23-year-old sales rep, and I saw somebody use PowerPoint. I don't know where I saw it. I can't remember, but I saw it, and I went, I got to have that. And at the time, nobody was using PowerPoint. Like, if you were going in with a presentation, the presentation was, like, a, you know, written on a document. It was all words. It was all paragraphs. And I saw these, this thing with pictures on it. And so I said, I'm, gonna, I'm getting that. And I went to my boss and said, I need PowerPoint. My boss said, it's too expensive. That's when software came in a box, right? So can't do that. And by the way, when you bought PowerPoint, you had to buy all of everything. And he said, no. And then I said, well, if I buy it, I need a laptop. And, and this is like, you know, 1993, you know, laptops weigh about 800 pounds. And he's like, <laughs> no, we're not doing that. This is not how we do it. You have a, you have a, like I had a portfolio with pictures in it, show them that. So, um, so I went and bought a computer that could run PowerPoint and I bought PowerPoint. And at the time, think about how expensive this was, it was like six grand to do this. And I went to my boss and said, I bought this. Now you're renting me a, a projector. And the projector came in a suitcase. And, and so I would, I would like, I learned PowerPoint, I mastered it. Nobody else was using it. And I would show up to, to my appointments to do my final presentations. And I'd have PowerPoint slides. And back then it was okay to have things spinning around and all kinds of little weird things and shadows. Like, you know, we weren't, it was, everything was 3D. Like it was really, I learned how to do it. I closed deal after deal after deal after deal. I went straight to the top of the ranking. I'm number one salesperson in the company. I still have a massive piece of granite. The chairman of the board of this Fortune 200 company handed me. And it wasn't because I'm the greatest salesperson in the world. It was because suddenly I'd mastered a technology that at the time was cutting edge and I looked different than anyone else. And like you said, the buyer said, looks like you do this for a living. And, and because I earned that trust, they would, they, they would buy from me. And, and I mean, they would come to me and say, that was the greatest presentation we've ever seen in our lives. We loved it. And the same thing happens to us here when, when people see what we do. You know, Will, we had the, the, the Marine Corps. They came from Quantico. They flew down here to view our studios because they were they were so blown away by what we do and what we do isn't not that not that hard it's just intention right we made this decision yeah. to look in a certain way even in this frame right here if you'll notice that i'm not in the middle of the frame this is an intentional right this is called the rule of thirds 
and to the human eye, just go watch, go watch a documentary. This is where you sit in a documentary, rule of thirds. I just happen to have really smart people around me who taught me this, but that's what, but that's, that's intention. And, and so you have to think through what are you doing to set yourself up so you're this much better than the next person? And that could be the webcam. By the way, you know, I can just tell you this. Cardinal rule, stop using the camera on your laptop for video calls. Just don't do it. It's not meant for that. You, there's no way you're going to look good. But you just, you're just going to be thinking to yourself, how do you do this? And then you start combining, you know, really cool tech like smart boards. Now, Will's not going to buy a smart board for all of his folks because they're, you know, the ones we buy are $3,500 a piece. Though they, you can spend ten thousand dollars on them but we've got we've got a sales studio where our salespeople go that we built specifically for that so when they're when they're having a conversation with a customer that matters we have one place where our salespeople can go where they can operate and we and we purpose built that for sales meetings awesome that's awesome i know that we can't all be as as innovative um, but there are a lot of technology out there that's constantly growing, especially over the last couple of years. Um, and we'll get into a little bit of that in a moment. But I want to just, before we jump into kind of this, this conversation intelligence side of the house um, and what you can do virtually with that, I want to just talk a little bit about messaging. And I think it can fold in together. But is there any, just off the top of your head, guys, any examples or any messaging specifically strategies that have helped um, reps on calls, um, either with winning over prospects, closing deals, or just being able to better communicate to stakeholders other than just kind of being present, making sure that you're, you know, you don't have a crazy background or you're, you know, we're losing you every time you move your head because you have a virtual background or something like that. Um, we'll maybe kick it off, see if there's anything that you do with your reps. Yeah. I think with digital transformation comes a whole new lever level of responsibility a performance and understanding a, a new key performance indicator set, new KPIs all together. Um, it does not many folks any good to get on a video call and then talk at someone for 15, 20 minutes because people could just show up to that later on their own time or listen to a call while they're walking their dog, right? And so we, we actually have a lot of different um, KPIs here around engagement time, mutual engagement of the prospect and the salesperson, how much listening do we do, how much do we embrace silence, how comfortable are we embracing silence and asking open-ended questions, what do we do when we get a wow moment, do we know they happen, <laughs> do we react to them the right way. Um, one of the favorites is monologuing. Uh, my kids are four and two, so we were the Incredibles for Halloween. So any Incredibles fans, they say, you caught me monologuing again, right? So like that, that's literally one of the newest forms of, of a key performance indicator. Not to mention, we give out awards every month to the salespeople that listen to the most calls, right? That observe the most calls, interact with calls that they've noticed really good things happening on. Um, it's a really cool way to incentivize new folks that have joined the team to go be self learners and curious. And I think those are tips that enable us to pick up on the stuff that's hard to teach in a classroom, right? You know, I noticed that our best salesperson tends to do these three things on every call, right? I've got a playlist of all those moments already pushed at me every day where I can click them and view them and just keep, keep reiterating them. So I don't have to be in every call that they're on, which I'm not going to be able to join. Right. Um, we're, we're messaging those things. The, the other piece too, is I think we've talked about it a little bit, so we don't need to go too far into it again, but when you see someone who's disengaged, just call it out. <laughs> like, you know, if it's you and someone else and they're sitting there, you know, mad dogging you and looking at you with frowny face and everything else. Like, be professional, be be courteous, be polite. But there is no better solution or tool out there than advocating for a no answer. Hey, you know what, Jeb? It really seems like your mind's set is somewhere else right now. It really seems like this might not be hitting for you. Um, you know, I usually when I'm telling folks this part of the the presentation, they're asking me tons of questions. They're they're raising their hands up in the air. I'm just seeing a different reaction. I just, let's pause here for a minute and just check down, right? And those 
skills are fine tuned by the KPIs that we track because we know which to look for, but also the ability to just have the confidence that again, you are a professional that does this job for a living. And if someone's not engaging with you, you know, any relationship has to be two way. So at a certain point, video off can lose the nuance, right? Someone may be perfectly engaged to you with their kid in their lap and they're really trying to do their best that they can, but they don't have their camera on and they're not comfortable turning it on. But I'm talking about those video on situations where, you know, you can just tell and, and there's nothing better than, than labeling those moments and really creating the relationship out of it, right? Because if you can message to someone, I see you, I validate you, you might not be doing something I want you to be doing, but I validate you and I see you, you know, those are big ways to progress the relationship towards some other conclusion, right? Might not be the one you were thinking about. Um, and, and that nuance on video takes confidence and practice, but you know, it was really helpful for our sales team when we put it to work. And you're exactly right. I mean, if you were in, uh, if you were standing in front of a group of stakeholders in person live and you're delivering a presentation, if it's around the table, you're, you're going to say, um, well, Rebecca, I, that was one of the things that we talked about when we were together um, learning about your department. Did I answer that question for you? Like, you're going to stop and do that if you have any skill. I mean, people, salespeople have been standing in front of other human beings in person monologuing for a long time. And they have ignored the signs that they're boring their, the audience to death. Or you see someone, you know, giving you the stink eye. And you know, one of my bosses, my, one of the old sales managers, taught me this a long time. He goes, "What he would do is he would he would say he would say, Will, you're not buying any of this, are you?' He would just do it just like that. And and like Will would go, "Oh no, no, I'm totally into it, or not a bit of this. I've heard the same thing. All your competitors that came in here, you guys are all all the same." And he would know instantly. Okay, we have work to do. We need to back up, and we need to do. We need to ask this person a question. Learning how to use other stakeholders in the room. But if I, could, if I could put everything that you said in a, a little box and put a bow on it, Will, what, what you said to me sounds like this. Where we sell has shifted. It's changed. And now we sell through multiple channels. We meet buyers where they are. And by the way, we have to be the masters at all of those channels in order to demonstrate that we're professionals at this. This is what we do for a living. How we sell has not changed interacting with other human beings, asking questions, listening, building relationships, connecting our value to the things that matter most to them, advancing deals through the pipeline. I mean, just because you're on a video call doesn't mean that there's, you wouldn't ask for the next step. Although I see salespeople do this all the time who wouldn't normally do that in person for some reason or another. They get to the end of the video call, see you shaking your head, and they go, they're just like waiting for the customer to do the job for them. So all of the basic fundamental tenets of professional selling that did not change just because where we sell changed and I, and i love by the way that you have like these kpis around like how they're you know how how much listening time are they doing i mean what a great way to teach people this basic of like the more you listen you know, the, the more you're going to sell. Like I, I had a group the other day that were, they want to learn about buyer style types. Like how do you flex to buyers? And, I, and we were teaching them, but I, I said, you know, but the basic fundamental here is that if your mouth is shut, the buyer style type doesn't matter because you're listening. So focus on that first. Love it. Awesome. Okay. So we've hinted at this a little bit. Um, I think we should just take a little bit deeper of a dive into it. So, Will, I'm going to Toss this to you again first, um, mainly because, well, you'll know. Um, what is conversation intelligence and why do you feel like your team or revenue teams need it? Sure. So I think we're, talk we're talking about a, a category that one of our products is in called Chorus, right? Conversation intelligence, I'll answer that by saying what it's not first. It's not call recording, right? There's Call recording has probably been around since Mr. Bell invented the telephone, right? As long as there was somebody there to write notes, right? Call recording is just one extra place that information goes that needs to be weeded through. And as sellers, that's helpful to us to go back and look at game film, but it's really important to be able to isolate on a key moment within all the noise of a conversation and do something about it. 
So um, imagine you know, a pipeline review with your boss where you're going through and your boss says, hey, where are we at with Acme Corp? And you say, well, I had a call with them and we did this, that, and the other thing and five other things happened and everything you know about the deal. We got the next step locked up. We got competitors identified, budget and authority and need, timing, all the rest. But imagine your boss sits there and listens and says, cool. I noticed about 32 and a half minutes into the call that the prospect said something where usually that means we've got some more work to do. Or I noticed about 16 and a half minutes in that they were looking at their cell phone and not paying attention to a thing you said and that was the most important part of our pitch. Now you missed it, I didn't. And then you're sitting there and you're saying to your boss, man, you listen to my whole call, I feel pretty special. And your boss says, no, I don't have time to listen to all 100 of my people's calls, but I found that key moment where I knew there was something we may have missed or could have done better or should be doing more of. And I know we can go impact our deal together because of it. Who doesn't want to be a part of that pipeline review, by the way, right? Number one. Number two, conversation intelligence empowers that scenario to happen where I don't have to go and listen to my call again and go hear everything and go weed through the notes while I'm doing five other things at once. I have a set of key snippets of information and then I have action plans I can go put to work based on those action items. And you know, not to mention, there might just be a library of really great moments that happen that you wanna have those as well outside of a pipeline review context. You know, How do people handle objections? How do people engage the right way? Who's got the best listen time on the team? Who, spe- who says the least words per minute? Not me, I talk way too much, right? Uh, but that's conversation intelligence. That's taking a business's information they've learned and gathered from interactions they're having with their prospective clients and not just recording it, but analyzing it, understanding and recommending what could be done with it. And that's a lot of those KPIs that we talked about earlier come as a result of using CI to really get a feel for, okay, our best deals look like this. The objections we handle are overcome when we do this. Um, It's better to go through the monologue and the Shark Tank pitch as fast as you can under five minutes. (laughs) Otherwise, this happens, right? Um, And those are things that I don't have to go listen to all of my reps calls. With all respect to them, I I can't. Um, And I have a small team, um, let alone our C-suite that has 800 folks to keep track of. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, Jeb, I'd love for you to just kind of from your perspective, especially in the current world, I think, you know, we're, we are coming, hopefully coming out of a pandemic, but a lot of companies have adjusted to this virtual, uh, more of a virtual or at home work style. Um, But I think there's some companies out there that are trying to bring back that field sales. So um, is, is conversation intelligence helpful in your mind for only inside sales or can it be utilized as a field sales situation? And any thoughts around conversational intelligence for revenue teams in general from you? I think the team, the audience would love to know. Yeah, well, I, you know, I wrote a book called Sales EQ, which is um, sort of an opus on the psychology of selling and how emotions drive decision making. And and so there's you know there's there's logic, right? There's you know how how good are you at the pitch and how how well are you able to connect the dots between a customer's problem and how we solve the problem with our technology or our product or service. Those things matter, don't get me wrong. But what matters more is how people feel. And you know, Antonio Damasio basically his uh, if you look at his studies and look at the studies of of so many social um, psychologists have proven over and over and again that human beings feel first than we think. And until robots are selling to each other, this is gonna be a human game. And and we are playing this 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 psych- psychological chess game where we're, we're, we're trying to get someone to feel that this is the right decision for them to make. Really simple stuff. So if you if you take sales EQ, the things that we talk about in sales EQ are really hard. Like, you know, actualizing emotional intelligence or you know, one of the things that we like to do is how few questions can I ask to get as much information as possible? So at what point did I trigger my customer's self-disclosure loop? So I got them to start freely giving me information without me having to interrogate them for it. And, and one of the issues with that is salespeople cut that off because they get too excited and they step on it. Like they, they wanna interject or they, they, they don't allow the silence to as leverage to pull the person in. 
in the old days, the conversational intelligence was conversational intelligence with your sales manager sitting next to you in a meeting and then kicking your rear end in the parking lot because you missed all the points. I even had a sales manager once. I'm in the middle of this big presentation. I mean, total dog and pony show. I've got the stakeholder group in. I've got my PowerPoint slides up. I've got my lucky tie on and I am going to town. Monologuing slide by slide by slide. And I hear out of the corner of my eye, I mean, I, 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 my ear, but I can see him fidgeting. He goes, Jeb, stop. And, I, and I'm like, what? And he goes, stop. And he turns around, looks at the stakeholder group, same guy. He goes, y'all aren't buying any of this, are you? And they all went, no. And, uh, and, and one of the people said, we just heard the same pitch from one of your competitors. Yeah. And my manager reaches over and grabs these books, like we were like physical books we had given him, and picks it up off the table and slams it on the floor and says, well, forget all of that. Let's start over again. But that was like, that's how you learn because there was a human being sitting next to you who did that. Like, I mean, I was embarrassed, but I got it. Like, if you don't stop and check, you're going to end up walking out the door and your deal's going to stall and you'll never know why. So what conversational intelligence allows us to do, and we use Chorus AI in our business as well, what it allows us to do is to have those check steps where instead of us as human beings, we're fallible, right? So we can't remember everything. Plus, we have a bias that, you know, we're really better than we really are. It allows us to see those places where maybe we miss something or like, um, Will, you said, maybe in that pipeline review, the, the leader saying, you're projecting this at 90%, you got no chance. Let me show you why. Like it's yeah. at this point right here that the customer told you that they're not that into you, but they didn't say it to your face because that's not how people do, right? They just said it passively. So that allows salespeople to suddenly start getting awareness, which is really one of the, you know, the, the keys to building great sales-specific emotional intelligence, to rise above the emotion and become aware of what they're doing so that they become more systematic and methodical about how they're engineering the relationship. And, and that's exactly what we're doing. And let's, you know, we, I don't want to you know, mix um, metaphors here and try to that's do this the wrong way, but we're not building friends when we're selling, we're closing deals. And, and we can't allow the relationship to get in the way of closing the deal. However, the relationship is why we close the deal. So in this bubble of professional selling, by having these, this ability to make our salespeople better by helping them become aware of where they messed up in the emotional side of things, like where they messed up in the human side of things, suddenly you elevate your game and what's really cool about it is your buyer doesn't know why. They just know it feels good. And when it feels good, they buy more. Really simple stuff. But we're, we're, we have to make sure that we get that this is a system and a process. And what Chorus AI does is it allows us to systematize a, 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 effectively the emotional connections that we make with buyers. And we'll, maybe you have a different look at that, but that's how I see it. No, 100%. I mean, even the field sales example, right? Think about what Jeb shared earlier, right? Anybody could record their calls. Anybody could ask their salespeople to log their notes in CRM and we have that tug of war battle another conversation another day, right? But how impactful is it where you have all of the key exact moments from any interaction you've ever had with this prospective account all isolated into a nice little bow for you, right? Because there are many tools out there that go and find out information for you or record interactions that you're having. It's not about that, right? The world's changed. Everybody's going this new direction. How impactful is it to be able to say, hey, we engaged with these three people. We saw these risks in our deal. And now I've got 17 other folks to go engage before we go fly out to Montana. And we do go sit down across the board meeting table with them. Uh, boardroom table with them and you sit down and you say hey I remember that thing that we talked about and they say you weren't even in the room that's amazing right because those are the differentiators just like video that's you showing up without the hoodie right that's you showing up with your background clean like I'm, I do this for a living ma'am like I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready like we're ready to support you I didn't take any of that for granted that's a horror story that so many sales leaders listening to this call have lived firsthand. Is I had a really good rep. She worked here for three years. She left, and I don't know what she was doing for the last 12 months because none of that stuff was in CRM. And she was my best rep, right? And even if I wanted to go listen to every call she's ever had or look at all the log notes that she did put in CRM, that would take me hours and weeks to go do it. And I still, even if I did that, wouldn't know what to go do beyond having that insight, right? Um, 
I think that's that's where we see a lot of folks that are in the field. You, you might not be on Zoom calls all day, but having every logged interaction isolated to those moments could be what makes and breaks your pitch, right? Well, the thing is, is that in the in the in the field we're blending these days, right? So we're in, if yeah. you're doing pure field sales, you're uh, you're you're at the end of an era because yeah. customers have changed. And when I say customers have changed, they haven't changed the way they buy or how they make decisions. They just changed the, the, the channels that they use. I mean, they recognize that having you show up at their at their office to do a 20 minute meeting and have to get you through security and take you through the COVID protocols and everything else is going on. It's just a, too much time. So they prefer to have a video call in most cases. But when it's time to go out and do the big presentation, they totally buy into that. Like they understand it. So, so many of your interactions are going to be virtual because you're blending. You're choosing different communication channels at specific points in the sales process that are going to give you the highest probability of gaining your outcome, your desired outcome, at the lowest cost of time, energy, and money. It makes you more efficient. So, using uh, Chorus AI in that process works, and that's one of the ways that I use it is exactly that. So when we're running our discovery calls, even though I'm making notes on the smart boards, I'm gathering all this information and then we go back and, um, and sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll have, like I'll sit with, the, with my earphones on and I listen to the recording rather than watch it. And then I'm, I'm looking at the, what Chorus is telling me happened. And, and then when I'm in situations, I can say something like, I'll say, you know, Rebecca, one of the things that I sense is that this is important to you. Now she didn't say that. But I'll, but I'll, and she'll, she'll light up and go, yeah, you're exactly right. You know, I didn't, I didn't think anybody's going to ask me about that. Or, you know, I, I've got a feeling that this maybe is one of the things that we might have missed. Now, sometimes I'm wrong. Like, sometimes I'll say that and Rebecca will go, no, 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 I'm good. Everything is fine. But it allows me to, 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 to look at where the holes were. And then when I'm going out to spend time with people in face to face, when I get on airplanes and go do that, um, when I when I get all of it together, by I, I don't well maybe the way it says I absorb the gist of the conversation like yeah. I get below the surface, and what happens is I, I study and prepare is that what comes out of my mouth is it, it feels to them like I'm speaking their language, and and in, in Rebecca's psychology that triggers the human similarity bias because if I'm speaking their language I feel like them and if I feel like them it's easier to trust me. And when you trust me, you're more likely to buy from me, right? So I, I bend win probability in my favor by gathering that information. And that's where, um, and I, you know, I'll admit that when, you know, when we first did Chorus and Brooke taught me into buying it, I was like, I don't know, I mean, this, I, I, whatever. Um, you know, if, if y'all want it, fine, you're, you know, you, you, you sell some things. But then, you know, as I started using it, I'm like, no, I want that. And I, you you got to get me a seat so it's on my account. So yeah. uh, because it's it's like it's been a game changer for me just being able to have that information. I'm glad. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Awesome, guys. OK, we have a little bit of time to answer some questions and audience members. We've been trying to answer them through the Q&A chat as well. Those that are coming in. Um, but we'll answer, uh, I think, a couple before we close out today. So I'm going to toss these. Both of these are, are a little bit more towards, it seems like we have a lot of um, team members or, or managers in the audience. So I want to just toss these to Will. But um, Jeb, obviously, feel free to add at any points here. Um, so Will, because we've got someone in the audience that's asking, how do I remember, and kind of hinted at this, and may have talked about this a little bit, but how do I remember everything down or having to listen to my entire call all over again? Any any suggestions there? With without having to write everything down, that's their question. Yes. Okay. Um, I mean that. So think about like sales is now we can call it. You know, it's it's becoming a, almost a sport, even more than it's ever been viewed as that metaphorically, right? And you know, professional athletes walk around with their tablets. You know, whether it's curling or volleyball or football or hockey or softball, they all have these tablets now. And, and I, growing up, I was like, what the heck? Really? That's awesome. But like, what the heck are you looking at? You're just going to watch the whole play. And what they're all doing is focusing on that key piece of technique or that key moment where a play fell apart to try and restructure it and do it better next time. And so conversation intelligence, just again, thank you to whoever asked this, is often incorrectly associated with just recording calls, right? Now, now Jeb is Tom Brady. Jeb's going to listen to the whole call 
and he like Tom Brady's going to watch the whole game. <laughs> that's what he does, right? Um, but that's not necessarily where conversation intelligence stops. And so as a seller, we don't have time to listen to eight hours of calls after an eight hour day. Um, now there, and again, I don't want to make this an advert for Chorus. There's other tools out there in the category. It's an exciting time to be selling sales technologies, right? Most of these will try to isolate a moment for you. There are reasons that Chorus does this a lot more accurately that I'm happy to get into outside of this, this setting. Um, but it's now, okay, I have this insight. What do I go do with it? Now, Tom Brady is Tom Brady, right? I figured out my elbow flew up a little bit because I found that one moment in the last play and I need to tuck my elbow down. Sales is a two-way road. So I figured out my prospect wasn't engaged. Now I need to go do something about it. I either need to call that out on my next meeting or I need to figure out, was that really my buyer? Was that a mobilizer? Was that a blocker? Do I have all the people involved? They were giving me everything I wanted, but now they're not taking the next step. Who else is in this account that I need to go talk to? And so that's the whole benefit of conversation intelligence for the person that asked the question. I don't need you to go listen to everything. I don't need you to write everything down. I need you to go make the time to find that moment and then do something about it. And that's what's going to impact your deal. And that's what's going to course correct, if not this deal, the next one that you're on today. Awesome. Okay, last question here. We'll wrap up with this one. Um, this is from Kevin. I'm going to toss this to um, Jeb. I think that, you know, I think both of you can answer this, but it's a pretty straightforward question. How often should I look at game film with my reps or my teams? Is there a certain cadence that we should do? Um, so, or a certain time frame? Is it only at, you know, pipeline reviews or, or what, whatnot? You should do this every day. If you think about Will's analogy of athletics, the, the coaches are looking at game film every day. They're, they're bringing their different teams in and they're looking at game film every day. If, you, if you're a field level coach or a sales, you know, sales manager, you need to be in the car with your people every day. If you are an inside sales manager, you need to be sitting side by side with your people every single day. So coaching never stops. And, uh, and, and that doesn't mean that you need to like have your people sit in a meeting room for eight hours a day. But if you're doing your one-to-one -one every single week, you might even ask your rep, is there a particular call you had this week that you wanted to look at together? Sometimes the rep wants to brag on something that they did. And in cases where you have a rep that maybe you're looking at their numbers and you're starting to see some, some trends that are worrying you, maybe you go back and look at some of the game film and just go through it and then sit down with them and say, hey, tell me what happened in this particular situation. And I'll give you a great example from, from, from my world. We have, uh, we have live chat on our, uh, on our website. I look at almost every single chat, almost every single one. Now you might think that that's nuts, for the CEO of a company be looking at every chat and we get tons of them to come in. I don't, I just, I skim them. I skim them, skim them, skim them. And then when I see something, it's typically what Will was talking about. I see the customer said this and you know, they, they type this in and my rep completely blew by it. Then I'll, I'll go back to the rep and say, show me what happened here and we'll talk through it. And it, I'll coach them and, this, and they instantly get better. That's what coaching is. And it, it it's, when done right, a really successful asset to your team is something that you do every day, all day, naturally, seamlessly, fully integrated to the stuff that you're already doing, right? So now we're selling over video. This isn't a new thing for us anymore, right? Um, you're prepping for a call in the next five minutes. Go look at the risks that were found in the last five interactions with your deal. I, a real world situation, I get it. You know, this is a great story, Jeb. You'll love this. Like, client used to spend $5,000 a year with us. A uh, company we acquired years ago, Point Solution, and we were too expensive. And they, they, they fired us as a customer. And we had a meeting with their new, their new leadership team. And so I went back and I said, show me all the risks. Just see what I found. Found the 30 second moment where the rep heard from the buyer. I'd love to learn about this piece. I, I can't get over your price, but I'd love to figure out a way to use this. Got on the call. Hey, is it unfair to assume that the things that you want to use this for don't apply at all to the things that you were trying to use this for? Yes. And now, no jinxies. It's 12x the value of an opportunity that's at the finish line of signing with us than what we got fired for for being too expensive. Yeah. Right. Imagine, imagine the impact of call game film recording just literally being a part of your everyday job to help you sell better. 
and and that's again that's what's a, there's so much available out there if you haven't walked through the door of digital transformation in 2022 like go through it it's a one-way door we're never going back right and and i hope that you'll go find value in what jeb's been writing about for literally years in sales eq right because that that is all true today as much as it is in the virtual selling sphere that he writes about in his newest books right but this is all things that make it so much easier and remove those barriers to entry to go engage with people better, faster, more. So, Awesome. Awesome. Thank you guys so much, Jeb and Will. It's just great content as always. Um, audience members, thank you all for joining us. Um, feel free to fill out that survey. Let us know if you're interested um, in speaking to us. There's a little bit of information within that. Um, we'll also um, give you some more details about course if you're interested. So definitely let us know. Um, and we hope that we were able to answer all of your questions. If we're unable to, um, for whatever reason, we will follow up with you shortly after. Um, but thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful day.